below the surface of the objection. Okay? Most of us, though, tend to want to fix the 10% that we hear. Hence the, you know, you don't have a local presence. We may not have a local presence, but we're available 24-7. That may not be the real objection. All right? We need to dig down and find out what this 90% is. So in order to do that, remember your, your presence. Be mature, be professional, be patient. Okay? Number two, when someone is you know, upset, when they blurt out an objection, we need to connect with them. You know what? They have the right to have their objection. What we need to demonstrate is professional courtesy and patience in understanding more about their objection. Okay? So relate to them. You can either acknowledge what you heard um, or you can uh, demonstrate some empathy if you really can relate to what they've gone through. You know, if they've, if, you know, what's today? We're hearing a lot of, well, if the economy's really tough. It's like, you know what? It has been a tough economy. I mean, who's going to kid you on that one? It has been, it's been a tough, difficult couple of years. Or simply acknowledge what you heard. And I want to be careful that you don't just acknowledge, and I call them trite phrases. Things like, um, I understand how you feel, or I understand your concern, or I can appreciate that. Think a little more genuinely, you know, with your conversation. Um, and I'll get some examples from you. We'll do an exercise in a few minutes, but one of them that comes to mind that I really like is something along the lines of like, um, you know, I'd like to understand more about that. All right, so you don't have a local presence. I'd like to understand more about that. Now remember, we said 90% of the objection is where? Below the surface. Right. So in order to find out things we don't know, we ask questions. And you may need to ask one or two questions, maybe three, um, until you know enough information that you really understand perhaps why or how important a local presence is to them, or what's been their experience. All right, so when you question, make sure that it's open-ended, and make sure it's relevant to what they've said. All right? Don't be asking questions that are kind of out of the ballpark. We don't have a local presence. Um, well, where do you normally buy your supplies? Okay, that's, that's not relevant to what their issue was. The issue was, we don't have a local presence, therefore I need to understand what their concerns are about that. And of course, listen, all right? Fourth of our six critical skills. Remember your presence, relate to them, question for more information, listen and listen to the responses so you can keep drilling down. Ah, now you understand why a local presence was thought to be important to them or is important to them. Now you get to position your recommendation. So I don't know what the answer was. Perhaps they had an issue with a rep that they didn't um, hear from often enough. Or perhaps they felt that they couldn't get their supplies in 24 hours if somebody wasn't local. I don't know. Whatever the issue was, now you can make your recommendation. Maybe you have express shipping or you have a 24-7 customer service support or tech support, whatever it is that you're going to make the recommendation, here's where you make it. Don't start with this the way some of us were, all right? Don't start with positioning. Make the connection, question. Now make your recommendation. Remember, any time you make a recommendation, check for their feedback afterwards. What questions do you have? Or how comfortable are you with that now? Okay? So that's why we want to remove ourselves from the adversarial side of the tennis court and we want to partner with our customer all right, and get on the same side of the net with them and work together as a team. And remember that 90% of the objection still needs to be found. All right? So don't jump in and fix them too early. Okay, now we're going to do a couple of exercises because we're going to have you practice using the objection resolution model and we also have um, a whole list of common objections that um, when we interviewed, when we put our book together and we interviewed your firm, we have a list of very common objections that I want you to work as a team to do the first couple of steps. Guys, you're really good at this. There's no question. You guys know how to position your recommendations. What we need practice on is slowing down and doing the acknowledgement statement and then asking an open-ended question for more information. Okay? So I'm going to break into teams again. I'm going to give you some to work on and then we're going to regroup again in about 15 minutes to share some of your responses to some of the most common objections that we deal with. Okay, before we do that, um, any questions or any feedback on using the objection resolution model? Excellent. Okay, let's get going. All right. Okay, perfect. All right. 
Okay, when we came in this morning um, and we talked about um, this developmental sales coaching class that we're participating in today, right, this workshop, um, a lot of you were concerned about how much time you have for coaching and how much more time it would take in a day for you to coach versus um, managing the way we are now. And one of the things I want you to be thinking about, because when we started off this morning, uh, you talked about you know, what, what did you want to get out of the program, some of the things that you mentioned that we have on our um, objectives list, right? Your goals for wanting to accomplish today. Things like, um, how do you motivate people? Um, how do you get people to embrace change? Um, how do you uh, find out if somebody really wants to be doing what they're doing? And those are all great questions that if you start using the proper coaching process, you will very, very quickly uncover and then be able to coach individually to that, to that person rather than um, kind of applying a, a one-size-fits-all fits all, um, technique on everyone. Every one of our team members are different and everybody needs to be coached differently. Okay? Um, when we talked this morning about how important coaching is, and a lot, a lot of you jumped in and said, you know, it's really important that we develop tomorrow's leaders, um, we're all doing more with less, uh, we all wanted to gain an hour back in our day, and the way we do that is we develop our people by coaching them and not by telling them. So let me just roll out what our developmental sales coaching framework looks like, and let's compare it to what we are typically doing now. All right, number one. Um, just as we talked about in the sales process, whether you're having a formal one-on-one -on -one with your team members, okay, so whether it's you've allocated 30 or 40 minutes to actually have a weekly or a monthly one-on-one -on -one with them, or whether you've just done a ride-along with them or you just observe some calls, um, you want to prepare your thoughts, you want to prepare yourself for that time together. I mean, how many of us have, you know, walked into a coaching session or, or feedback session with one of our <coughs> team members and because we forgot to review our notes, or we didn't take a look at comments, or we didn't articulate our thoughts, it didn't go very well. Yeah, okay. So we want to avoid that. And especially as the manager, they're looking to us, right? I mean, the expectations, the bar for us is set up here. So number one, what is it that you want to accomplish in that coaching session? What's your goal? Second, when you share your feedback, think about the, the balanced feedback. Number one, what would you tell that person that they're doing well? And second, what would you um, tell that person that they could be doing differently? Okay, so balance feedback and what's your goal? All right. Second, how will you open your one-on-one -on -one time together? Um, remember, some of the key, key things to be thinking about with opening is uh, keep it neutral. All right, something like, you know, I, I'd really like to talk to you about that call we went on this morning versus, all right, let's spend some time debriefing our time together this morning out on the road. I mean, which one of those sounds a little bit more neutral, okay? Because what we're trying to do is set the stage for a collaborative dialogue with our team members, all right? Again, just like in the sales process, you don't want to just jump right in and get into, okay, here's my feedback on our call today. You want to ease them into it. You want to make them comfortable. You want to take a moment to build some rapport, all right? Make them feel comfortable. So again, it gets back to our six critical skills. Think about, do you think your presence is impacted by the level of preparation that you put in? Yeah. Can your presence and relating skills help you in your opening? Definitely. And even your questioning skills, right? Asking nice questions, maybe how their weekend was or um, how their vacation was. Okay, now that you've set the stage, let's spend some time debriefing our calls together. Here's a mindset change for a lot of coaches. Sharing perceptions and the most important thing to remember about this is getting their perceptions first before we share our own. All right? I want you to think about the importance of actually sitting down and saying to somebody, you know, what do you think went well in that meeting this morning? And getting them to actually share their thoughts. Um, I'd encourage you to not open with kind of the age-old question of, so how do you think that call went? All right? Uh, the reason is, I think it's just too generic, and many times, more often than that, than not, they can just blurt back, well, I thought it was okay, why, what do you think? And then, boy, what does coach do? Well, I'll tell you what I think, and sure enough, we end up taking over our one-on-one -on -one time together, and it's all about our perceptions again. So slow down and ask their perceptions first before you share your own. 
The other thing that I would encourage you to do is if they actually say things that you agree with, let's say, you know, I think I did a great job of um, asking questions because, you know, I, I, I did get a lot of information and I probably should have asked more open-ended questions instead of close-ended because some of his answers were just yes or no. And if you saw that and just say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, I agree with you on that, encourage them so that they know that you, um, first of all, you support them, and second, that you're there, all right, that you're paying attention and that it encourages them to continue. And then, of course, coach, share your perceptions as well. Once you have an understanding of what their perceptions were, then we need to get in and identify the obstacle and remove it for them to do better. Let me explain this to you. Let's say their perception is, well, I don't ask enough open-ended questions. A lot of managers would stop there and say, you're right. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ask more open-ended questions when you get out in front of your customers. And our reps smile and nod and everybody leaves and we think that we were a great manager. You need to get deeper than that. I want you to ask the questions of your rep and say, so why are you not asking more open-ended questions? Or what's preventing you from asking more open-ended questions? And I can promise you they're gonna squirm here. They're gonna get a little uncomfortable because you're actually getting much deeper than the surface. Okay, I wanna go back to the objection resolution model. Um, here you're getting a portion of what their obstacle is, but this is where you uncover the real obstacle and work together to remove it. So is it that they're not preparing well enough? Is it that they haven't put more than two minutes of thought into this particular call? Is it that they've never put a process or a plan together ever on you know, pursuing some of that? So find out from them why they're not asking enough open-ended questions. And together, come up with ideas for them to get past that. Now, coach, again, don't jump in and say, well, I'll tell you what, Friday, bring me a list of open-ended questions. Let's go over them. No, get them to come up with the ideas. Just say, look, how would you then work on better identifying open-ended questions. Get their responses. Well, I could probably make a list. Great. All right, so when are you gonna put that list together? Well, I guess I could do it this week. All right, and coach, you can encourage them. It's like, well, um, how'd you like to run that list by me and, and get my thoughts? Welcome, you know, they, they appreciate that. But remember, get them to think. We're not just trying to, as the old analogy goes, I know if you give them fish, you feed them for a day. Um, if you teach them to fish, then you feed them for life. And this is part of teaching them to fish. We don't fix it for them, they help fix it themselves. And you'll love this part. Now that you've had your one-on-one, -on -one, and by the way, this could be five minutes or this could be 35 minutes. This is all dependent on how much time you've allocated for that one-on-one. -on, -one. on the close, get your rep to summarize your time together, all right? Most of the time, coaches, we say, okay, here's what you're going to do, here's what you're going to do, you're going to get back to me. Stop and say to them, all right, so why don't you give me a summary of what we've gone over? First of all, they're probably going to be surprised, all right? But second, think about this. If they can't say it, it means they didn't really see it, which means they don't really own it. So get them to articulate here what you'd agreed upon, what action steps they'd agreed upon. All right, and here's one of the most important parts for you, coach. That's the follow-up. Document what it is that you've agreed upon. Put it in your calendar. Get ready for that next meeting when it's time to debrief again. Because I want you to think about this. What happens if coach doesn't follow up? They won't ever develop. Okay. They're not going to develop. What message does it send to that team member if you don't follow through? That it probably wasn't important.